And the today's topic is a little bit slightly different, but it really ties back to what we've been discussing. It's all about communities. So basically, we're going to share some strategies that maybe others can follow to build a community, but also how is the communities all over the world. And when I say community, we mean a nonprofit organization. We mean um, uh, maybe a city coin, right? Like we mean a city, uh, a government, a school, a university. So this is all different kinds of communities. And we want to talk about how our community is shifting. And what about decentralization? Like what benefits will communities have to be more decentralized, uh, to have open source network, um, to have more uh, niche apps that are customized to their needs and to use also cryptocurrency to benefit them and smart contract as well. Greg, do we have you back on the line? Yes. Yes, I'm here. Um, we just finished with the introduction uh, of the team and kind of like what we're going to talk about today. So I was talking about how we want to, uh, you know, kind of like talk about the community aspect of uh, blockchain and how communities are slightly shifting to be more open source network to to be more decentralized and what are the benefits for that and maybe even talk about what intercoin and cubics and other companies out there are already doing and how we can help communities not just like grow but how they can monetize by inviting members by um having some type of like a crypto payments within their own network to grow their local economy and to make it easier for people to join a community and just you know collaborate and build that that aspect that um the economy that we all talk about so just to make sure are we live on youtube we are live on youtube you forgot to press the record button when you were doing the telegram video chat we could have been recording everyone's introductions from the beginning. <laughs> so we missed that. Oh, yeah. It's okay. People probably uh, might have heard us from the previous shows. Hopefully. So we're recording both on Telegram, the voice chat, which has maybe better quality. And then we're also streaming live on YouTube. And um, so you could always watch this later on YouTube. We encourage all of you guys to go to YouTube and subscribe. Click the notification button so that you can be notified live show and you can follow us there with super chats and stuff like that or you could follow us with uh, telegram everyone knows i like telegram i think it's very streamlined it's very nice and hopefully will continue to improve but what i like about it is rock solid so if you're here on telegram please come back next week um, but if you want to watch the show you could always go to inter youtube.com channel intercoin and then you could see in a second, you're going to see the live chat happening, the Intercoin show. Later, we change the the uh, we later change the uh, title of the show, uh, but local currencies is what we have currently going on as the uh, thing. All right. So city coins, we've been talking about city coins. Um, I think uh, I'm going to be meeting with some people about city coins. Uh, as we know more, we're going to make a public announcement on our forum, community.intercoin.org. So probably we should talk about building our own community, how our community works. Start there. But City Coins has already raised a bunch of money for New York City Coin, has already raised a bunch of money for Miami Coin. And the mayors of those cities had some ideas, which in my opinion, uh, well, Miami mayor had some opinion, uh, had some ideas which were so far pretty tame. Uh, compared to what Intercoin can do. The idea was to let Citicoin uh, simply be staked and then they earn some Bitcoin and they give this Bitcoin to everybody. So I'm going to try to find it during the show. I'm going to try to find a video of the Miami mayor announcing this and we can go through it as to why they should consider instead to take some of the city coins and put them in the Intercoin network, which would allow the coin to circulate in their community in their city rather than having just Bitcoin, which people can spend and it will leave the city as soon as it um, is given out. So anyway, so that's my little intro for today. Also, I just wanted to say that um, people are recognizing that social and community is coming back. Andreessen Horowitz, the largest, uh, the largest, um, what is it called? Um, venture capital firm. 
in America, they are bullish on social. And they said social is coming back. It's not done. And it's actually enhancing everything, including it's going to enhance um, the metaverse. It's going to enhance NFTs and it's going to enhance uh, crypto. Union Square Ventures, their thesis uh, back in 2012 was about social, but they updated their thesis and their new thesis is about also about community building and social. These are two of the largest um, venture capital firms that have funded the likes of Facebook, Twitter and others. Uh, maybe not Facebook, I'm not sure, but definitely Twitter and definitely a lot of household names. So whether it's venture capitalists or mayors, or anyone else recognizing the community building can make the difference between like a bad economy and a good economy, right? And stuff like that. So that's basically what I wanted to uh, just throw out there at the beginning of the show. This is their thesis from three years ago. And, um, you know, this is what they funded Twitter, Etsy, Tumblr, Foursquare, Kickstarter and others. And um, they talk about their new thesis is all about um, community. Uh, so that's basically what um, our show is about today. And I'd love to sort of see different aspects of community. We have about uh, 45 minutes that we could go through the types of things that are happening now, how NFTs represent membership in a community. Why do people get NFTs? And what does it mean to have an online community versus an offline community? So that's basically what this is about. So, Greg, um, just to make sure that you show some of the clubs that I shared before in Telegram on a separate chat, just to kind of give the people the idea where we talk about decentralization communities and what communities can do that maybe they're not aware of and what we have already helped them with. I think that might be a good um, way to start um, so people can have a better idea, even what does it mean to have a decentralized community? So right now, a community usually is formed either on someone's website uh, or you know they're on Facebook or LinkedIn or some other social media platform that actually they don't own. And whatever data is collected, whatever people, if they're inviting someone to be part of the community, they're not really making any money. They're not bringing any money to the community unless the community is trying to sell something with, again, promoting uh, ads, which, you know, again, they have to pay Facebook or they have to pay another social media platform. So this like really becomes like an obstacle for a lot of the big communities out there. They're really trying to do something with this community. They have spent a lot of money, a lot of years into building. So for example, if something happens, right, let's say you've had a community on Facebook for 20 years and it's like a million people that follow your brand or your university, whatever the community might be. If something happens, you something violated the community guidelines or you didn't see that, you post maybe a video that it wasn't yours, you can actually have, you know, potential Facebook to ban your entire community. So your community can disappear overnight. And that's like a challenge that many communities don't realize until it's time, until they have already had that. So it makes it raises a question, why should we even have a community? on someone else's platform where they can build their own community and their own platform based and customized to their needs, their goals, and why not even incentivize their own members by inviting other members by, uh, you know, if let's say someone watches your videos and comments, why not reward them with that? Because they've been your uh, community loyalty member since like, I don't know, five years ago, right? So a lot of people don't even know that this might even be something that they can consider and cubis is already doing this cubis has already had huge successful stories uh with other communities that they have helped to make it uh customizable and really to to focus on those needs so uh greg do you want to maybe talk a little bit more about what cubix has done with some of the communities out there and uh I guess like what are the benefits for, for those communities to like uh, go from an open source network, I mean, to um, a very centralized network to an open source network? Sure. I'd like to play like two professionally produced videos that probably drive the point home really well as to why you would want to have your own community. Um, first is a video that talks about why you would want to have your own community. 
And another video talks about why an open source platform is something that you can benefit from versus a closed source platform like Facebook, which doesn't give you the source code, doesn't let you control anything about their servers, and simply you're a guest and you can get kicked out anytime, right? And that's the same with all big tech, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Google, whether you are uh, in a social network or whether you are doing something that you might not traditionally think of as social, which is like collaborating on a document, Google Docs, right? Is what you would do for that. So you're living in someone's feudal universe, uh, whether that's uh, Google Suite or whether that is Microsoft Office 360, right? If you need to work on documents and spreadsheets, you work in the Microsoft uh, feudalism, uh, feudal lord, or you choose your feudal lord to be Q uh, uh, Google. You don't choose your feudal lord to be Cubix because Cubix is more like WordPress, um, where you know WordPress doesn't own your blog doesn't even host your blog if you don't want to. You can host your blog anywhere. The difference is that in the free market, you get to choose your landlord. And the problem is the social platforms that we all use today, like it says here, are centralized under the control of large corporations. All our conversations, our very identities, private documents and public announcements, they're all hosted on their servers. So the vast majority basically are living the way that feudal serfs used to live. And we have the same mindset Amy Lord, we need to, you know, like, I can't do the accent of the, um, you know, from the Warcraft. Amy Lord, you know, I need your favor to look upon me with favor and please help me, right? The thing is, like, you need actually features that you can use on your own machine, like you use your browser here. So rent seeking is what they say, right? That's what landlords literally do is extract rents due to the imbalance in power. But the societal problem is even bigger because as a society, if our public forums and spaces and discourse are all taking place on privately owned things, and you know, if we say that if we built it, you own it, well, that means Mark Zuckerberg owns Facebook and Jeff Bezos owns the marketplace and Amazon, right? What is really ownership and does it ever become bigger than them and does it belong to the society? That's an open question. Depends if you're a socialist or, or a capitalist or whatever, you fall on, on that spectrum. But how about sidestepping that question and simply having your own open source software? So that's basically what Cubix does. We follow in the, in the footsteps of WordPress. And this is what we offer to communities. Check it out. Imagine reaching out to your customers, members, and alumni, and telling them you've launched an extended community, helping connect them with each other, on their own time, around their own interests. Imagine if they can sign up in one click, with no forms to fill out. Imagine if they connected their address book and started inviting their friends, earning tokens in your app. Imagine if they could pay for your online classes and events using Apple Pay or Google Play, right in their browser and earn group discounts for bringing new guests. Why pay for marketing if your own members do it for you? Why chase people down for membership fees when the app can help automate it? You don't need to imagine. We help our customers do this every day. We start with your existing community and schedule a consultation with you to understand your brand and your business. We produce a roadmap for how to turn your website, page, or channel into a thriving community. We build your entire app for you, help you maintain it, and coach you on how to release it in the App Store and Google Play. Admins, events, video conferencing, memberships, payments, leaderboards, even group rides. People can meet in person or online. We help everyone stay in touch without scanning a ton of business cards. Want to find out more? Tell us about your organization, and let's talk about how we can get you to the next level. So that's what Cubix offers. And Intercoin's been spun out of Cubix in order to take that same approach with the blockchain. So Cubix can help people socialize, collaborate on documents. But once those documents become more valuable and important, and once you have coins and elections and things like that, you can no longer have just a centralized database. Yes, you can choose your own landlord, for example, my email at nyu.edu or any other domain. 
But of course, the landlord will still have all of your data. And sometimes you want to have a measure of sovereignty over your own data. That's why crypto has private keys. Of course, private keys used to exist before cryptocurrency. Crypto, you know, should stand for cryptography. There's this uh, debate now. Cryptographers want to take back the word crypto because they don't like that crypto is now being used everywhere. Uh, you know, basically, I put this on my Facebook too. Cryptographers are very upset and they're constantly trying to get uh, you to stop using the word crypto to mean cryptocurrency because there's so much more that cryptography is doing. But because of crypto.com, by the way, which is a exchange, I think they're going to lose because crypto.com is literally putting the word crypto on everything and they're going to kill the word just like we killed the word friend. Facebook killed the word friend and killed the word like. When I like something, I used, it used to mean something. When someone's my friend, it used to mean something. But now it mostly means Facebook friend. It cheapened it a little bit. So I think uh, the word crypto will be cheapened. But anyway, cryptography and cryptographic keys is what you need in order to have control over your own identity. And that's what we're doing with Intercoin and, and so on. But just to tell you that we have already a ton of... Um, a ton of stuff that we've already built with Cubix. And the big one is the Cubix platform. The Cubix platform is essentially an open source network, uh, uh, sorry, an open source piece of software that lets anyone have their own community software. So I'm going to play this for you. And I think this is very important. I can play it in its entirety because it's our video. And um, you get to see exactly what open source does to transform society from a closed feudal society to an open free market. So here we go. The social platforms that we use today are all centralized. Whether it's Facebook, Twitter, Uber, or any of a dozen others, both people and organizations have come to rely on giant monolithic platforms to connect them, mediate their interactions, and trust them with their data, identity, and brand. It starts simply enough. A few smart entrepreneurs build a useful platform. They get their first users, and pretty soon, it becomes clear that this platform is the next big thing. Investors start putting in money as more and more people around the world join this centralized platform. Now, third-party developers are invited to build apps on top of it, adding even more value to the community. The problem is that it's all centralized. One company controls all the interactions. People build their social identity on its domain. Companies host their brand identity on there too. Developers get API keys to build atop the platform. At any time, the platform could delete an account, shut down a community, or revoke API keys of a developer. It could start charging more, or just shut down the service altogether. Now consider how we interact in real life. On the left, Bob and Alice are working in an office. They're thinking of grabbing lunch later. Alice and Carol plan to catch a movie that weekend. Across the street, a professor is teaching a class where they all collaborate on a document together. What happens today is that signals travel all the way to the centralized platform, to the company's servers hosted far away in another country or state. This requires scaling up, and money is spent on giant server farms. Storing all the people's information in one place attracts advertisers and government agencies looking to collect information about people in bulk. Open source software can help change this paradigm. It's software that anyone can download and install or even freely build on top of. Let's say a person wants to host their own website or blog. They choose their own web host and install WordPress, an open source blogging platform. Now they can publish their own blog to their friends or over the internet to anyone in the world. They can also install WordPress plugins developed by people all around the world to extend their blog in new ways. The whole time they stay in control of their own data and their own website. Cubix began as a social network just like any other. We had a vision to help people get together in the real world. So we built several apps, real life events, group rides, conversations, a marketplace to buy and sell, and dating. Then we realized we built a social platform 
that can benefit entire communities. So we went ahead and made it open source. Suppose you're a community that works hard to organize events and programs, but now you want to release an app for your members to interact with each other. You set up a server, install Cubix, and now your members can do all these things on their own time, helping unite your community. You can then install even more apps and plugins developed by others around the world, and it all works locally on your own servers. This leads to an organic, decentralized ecosystem. Communities host social apps on their own servers, which run Qubits. Developers build more apps, which they can sell directly to the communities without fear of being disconnected by a centralized platform. They can build entire businesses around the apps and plugins they develop. Meanwhile, people can have an account in one or more communities and control their identity as they move between them. That's how it works. Here's how that works. All right. John is a member of three communities. So I'm going to stop this now. A university, now. an online news portal, and an interest group. Sorry, my computer is in slow. In each community, he has a different user ID. Now he lets his friend... All right. That's basically what we've built. Today, we're one of the perhaps the biggest, um, most advanced solution for open source communities in the world. There is Matrix, there is Mastodon, and they're big and they're well-funded. But Cubix has way more features than they do. If you go to uh, features uh, PDF and you look through the features that Cubix has compared to Matrix and Mastodon, you're gonna see chat, video conferencing, events, group rides, people, payments, notifications. You can edit entire articles together collaboratively, social media integrations. And I'd like to play one more video, but just to show you, um, all of these things are live. I can show them to you in person, or I can. you can always watch the videos. Everything has been documented for Intercoin. Google Fi, a phone plan by Google. And we're gonna see- End-to-end -end encryption automatically secures calls between- And you're gonna see the same uh, here. So I'm Between sorry Android with phones on five, so they can be private. Plus Here's video conferencing. And this is from two years ago. Back when I did not have a beard. So you can use it on a laptop. You can use it on a phone. You can have multiple people sharing screens, talking. All of it open source. All of it running on your own site. Not on Zoom, not on Facebook. You can have group meetings. You can have any configuration you want. And this is just one of many components. So you can have debates. <laughs> Basically, you can even have calls coming in with the same way that it works with Telegram. All of this is available to be mixed and reused however you want. We're very big on remixing and reusing. So the video I wanted to show just real quick is this. Uh, people. Why do people need it and why do communities need it? Uh, here is what the people have to say about it. One sec. Here we go. Communities. Ah, no, it's the wrong one. I apologize. I'll do one more. I apologize. Here we go. Cubix testimonials. This is what people have to say about why they wanted to, to do it. YouTube. Here you go. These are directors of the communities themselves. And one of the best things that people told me about this event is how we can bring such a diverse group of people together and they're able to connect, communicate, and collaborate because of the networking technology. Since this app, in my mind, will address the 
biggest challenge that the organizations have is the being able to be effective in terms of follow-up, right? So it's a no-brainer that if on one hand you have ability to maintain all of your previous investments, right, which is in millions of dollars, or completely lose it, it's a no-brainer that just for a little bit more you will uh, invest into it. Currently, our business model is pretty much set up 90% of our clientele comes as a referral from other clients, from other patients. And we are able to, Cupid is able to track who referred and what referred, and we are able to see exactly what the patients are coming from. The referral. So that made a big difference for your business? It made a big difference. We use the app that Cupid's put together for us, right? Uh, it was a GBA community, and a lot of people, they were invited in, they were able to create profiles, they were able to, to connect with each other, set up meetings, you can scan business cards, all the things that you need to do. You know, the speakers were great and people learned a lot, but people come to these events so that they can network, right? And the, the capacity that they have to be able to do that and the support they have with the technology just blew away anybody's expectations. In order to make the platform that we need for that benefits, we had to customize everything. We couldn't go just to Google and Facebook and get the tools there just somehow. They can't just do Google and Facebook. Cubics was able to create a customized version of their platform towards basically the, towards the needs that we have. Programs like Google Docs, honestly, and as well as Facebook, but those are very mediocre. That's really being able to keep up with the students to maintain that connection and relationships has really been a big challenge. When with Cubics we made money, we were able to, pretty much within a few months, recover what we paid, what we paid the Cubans, and since then we didn't cross it. And who are these people? I'll explain. Since then we have thousands of members that joined us, and the business is constantly growing, and we are happy and our to have My name is Gerard Gache, I'm the Executive Director of the Government Blockchain Association, or GBA. We're a 501c6 nonprofit. We uh, have we're an organization that has uh, about 100 chapters around the world. We've got about 15,000 people to connect through those chapters. We've got about 50 working groups. Uh, it's a very complex, dynamic uh, organization with uh, government and private sector people. My name is Rabbi Yaakov Pesach, and I run an organization called Macor International. We work with students and young professionals from North America, Germany, and Russia. Bring them to Israel. We educate them and help them develop into true Jewish leaders that will go back to their communities and make a difference. Hi, my name is Dr. Michael Lentin, I'm a dentist. I'm the founder of the Dent Benefits Membership. Uh, we had people come together from all over the world, from Asia, from Africa, from uh, Europe. It was uh, an incredible group of people. We had speakers from the World Bank, International Monetary Fund, uh, government, uh, government leaders from, from Many government organizations, the House, the Senate, uh, Library of Congress, DHS, I mean, it's just incredible uh, uh, collection. And academia, we had just world-class uh, academic teams. Bring thousands, tens of thousands of people to Israel, right? We run programs all throughout North America, and people get very, very inspired. Uh, but then, fortunately, this unity and this inspiration, it, it kind of like, you know, it fizzles out. And we do programs afterwards, we try to do things to build on it, but because this unity has really not um, been fostered, it's not really been maintained, um, it, we have not been as effective as we really like to be. Make Cubics came and they, they put that app together, they built it for us, it just blew me away. And, uh, and I didn't really know what to expect, but when you deployed the app and you showed me all the features and the functionality, I, I knew this was going to be a great, a great one. So I really want to thank you for, uh, for all that you've done for us. Absolutely. Yeah, we, you know, without a doubt. Uh, well, only if, if during your conference you want your people to have a good, you know, a, a good experience and get value. So that's... I believe the tools that are going to become very successful and very used are the tools that foster connection between the people. I think right now there is much more of a disconnection, right? People can go and they post on Facebook about what's going on with them, what's happening in their life, kind of like announcing what's going on. But it's really not fostering... The, the unity really so much, right? People can send each other emails, but to, to foster something that's that's united, something that people are excited, like a powerful direction, powerful movement, that has really, we haven't seen that.
So that's Cubix. That's what Cubix does. And I think we can do a lot more going forward. So Greg, just to kind of like stop a little bit, because I wanted to give um, the opportunity to some of our team members to talk about the community. Mm -hmm. um, so Alicia, if you're still with us, I really wanted to kind of hear about how you're seeing um, other communities out there changing with the blockchain industry going uh, in the rise and how they're trying to be more custom. Do you have any information on what you're seeing on the social media platforms that you follow? Alicia, Alicia are you still with us? I'd be muted. Or even Stacey, there might be, I guess, I can, the same question yeah, for I you. Yeah, I can answer that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I just feel like um, so many different crypto projects to NFT projects, they're all so different, and they all have such a different vibe. Like, one thing I'd have to say is the NFT community itself is, like, in a whole, is so supportive of, of each other. Um, they just seem to be, like, they collaborate a lot and all that kind of stuff. And one thing about that community that I notice is the NFT community is a community that brings in a lot of new people into crypto. Usually when I talk to people in groups and that, one of the first things I ask them in an NFT room is, have, were you into crypto before you got into NFTs? And generally the answer is no. So I just, I, I really like that community. I'm pretty new to the NFT community myself, but in a short period of time, you can learn a lot as for crypto, um, it's like every different project has a different type of vibe. Like there's the meme coins and those communities are generally, I mean, every age group possible, but I feel like they pro probably would bring in more younger people than some more utility projects. But it's quite a fun vibe, um, lots of memes and all that kind of stuff. And then, for example, a project like layer finance if you look at their social media it's totally different um it's basically you know people that are way in, more into utility maybe people that have been into crypto a little longer so it's all just so different hey guys can you hear me now yes yes, yes we, we can, can. So sorry i was having some issues with my phone um yeah just everything that stacy said i just i totally you know, agree with that. And in the NFT space, you know, as a traditional artist going into more of the NFT side of things, the NFT community has been amazing. You know, it's been so welcoming. I I've seen so many people just come in and, you know, just, it, you know, do, you know, getting noticed, you know, getting noticed more. And um, overall, I just think that it's, you know, a great, a great thing with social media and so many it, there's just so many new things coming out as well and it's just a great thing how do you all think about using nfts to represent membership in a community what would you say nfts do when you're buying an nft right and you display it as your profile picture or whatever the pfps i think they're called right stacy what um what exactly does that represent and how does that feel from a sociological point of view, like what exactly happens socially that when you have an NFT versus if you don't, like how do people know that you have one, you know? Well, clout, if it's in your profile, if it's your profile picture, it's clout. It means you belong to something. So automatically people just, I don't know, engage with you, connect with you. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a real cool vibe. So, like, if I have a board ape and I put it, the board ape yacht, yacht club, does that mean I can go and, and party on a yacht? Is that, <laughs> is that a, actually like a ticket if I have the NFT, I can show up to the yacht? Or is that just a... You, you are invited to the yacht club. Yeah, you're invited to the yacht party, all that. Okay, so that's huge. So having an NFT be like an Eventbrite, an Evite uh, ticket, whatever, Eventbrite, yeah? that basically looks like an ape and depending on what you have. So Intercoin, at Intercoin, we want to give that to everybody. Uh, we want to have maybe not a beautiful or not so beautiful ape 
but like maybe we want to have a badge, right? So imagine if each community could have badges designed by artists or maybe not, and then that community would represent your status within the community with a bunch of badges, right? So when you go to like Stack Overflow, and this is as old as like the Web 2.0 internet, right? So when you go to Stack Exchange or one of these uh, things, you could see all the badges that I earned. Um, you've earned the Necromancer badge uh, for answering a question more than 60 days old with a score of five or more. So like very technical reasons for getting the badge in this case, but if you look at all my badges somewhere, maybe I could be proud of them. Uh, and, and so that's, a, that's kind of like an NFT type of thing, right? Achievements, badges. But I I'd think, say so, yeah. Yeah, like it could go further though. I think the idea of access, who is the mayor of New York City? Like everybody knows that because New York City is famous, but like who's the mayor of, you know, who's the mayor of, of a township in New Jersey? Like nobody knows from outside of it. But on the, on the blockchain, you could easily see who it is and what if that was the trusted source of information? And then the mayor would appoint people and you have no idea who they appointed. But when you look on the blockchain, ah, there it is. So for public services and public positions, I think there's a huge need for community membership to be represented. And I think that's basically an NFT, right? That's basically saying it's like being a member of an of a exclusive club or in this case, you've been appointed to a certain thing. So what do you think? Um, can NFTs become sort of meshed with these badges and these, you know, status symbols, I guess? Absolutely. I think, you know, building a community around your, you know, your collection and, you know, having these people be a part of it and also investing you know, not only into, you know, the art, but also into crypto and learning about that as well. So everything kind of comes together as a community. So I definitely think Endercoin can play a huge role in that. What if we were to give people badges that were like whatever we chose, but they could customize them as their own identity a bit? That would be really cool, actually. I think that would be something that I would definitely use, for sure. So I love that. I think that's why we got the NFT remix that, you know, I was going through different names, NFT mix, I eventually got to NFT remix. And I really like that because people know about remixes on the web, right? Mashups, you can remix content. And there's the word tree in there, NFT mix, right? If you say it quickly, NFT mix. And that idea of having a tree of possibilities starting from the beginning, maybe you make it your own. I think that should be the tagline. Have an NFT, make it your own, right? Why You just bought it. Is that the end? No, you can actually interact and maybe imagine buying a Picasso and being a co-artist with Picasso. And then people buy your Picasso plus whatever you've put in, in there. I think that can be the NFT 2.0. I really do. Um, and that's what you're talking about, right, Stacy? a little bit. is like, put your own spin on it, basically. Exactly. And then people would even want to display it more on social media. I think so. Okay, so, so that's what Intercoin's going to be doing with NFTs. And when we talk to celebrities who want to put their likeness, they can actually do that and they can control who it goes out to. And maybe they can have 10 artists have fun with their likeness and their character in the new movie and that's what is going to drive people to the brand and to see the movie and at the same time the 10 artists could maybe make a lot of money because they imagine having a mashup between you know two totally different artists right there's a uh, Winnie the Pooh character right and the animators and the music but then you got a mashup with like a hip-hop guy you know adding the music to it whatever could be really really interesting to have these nft remixes essentially you know yeah i totally agree also twitter have i think twitter are going to start doing uh, verifying nft nfts as profile pictures are read uh, i don't know how far along they've got with that but apparently yeah they're going to 
be verifying it. So you can't just like screenshot a picture and have that sort of expensive board ape, a eh, board ape yacht club. Um, yeah. So they're actually going to actually have some sort of verification alongside it as well as the you know, the blue tick. So I was talking to Danielle about this, and I was saying to her that we can already do this without Twitter. And it would be excellent because I always want, again, remember the whole thing is we don't want the large corporations to be, we don't want to be dependent on Twitter to put that blue check mark, right, and then control who gets the check mark and who doesn't. We have private keys. We can sign our own proofs that we don't need. To. So Intercoin can actually help you dox yourself. If you own a specific um, NFT, you probably doxed yourself in terms of that address already because we went through this and basically if you are someone who owns a really unique nft that's rare and expensive then we know that you own the address that owns the nft and so basically you that wallet belongs to you um but just displaying it on your profile is not enough because like you said anybody can do that so what you would need to do is essentially go and uh, use the intercoin app but you could use any other app but we would be the first one to literally just associate your wallet with your identity. Um, and we already do this, like when you go to um, one of these um, apps that we build, like Yang 2020, you can sign with your wallet, you can sign anything and it pops up, MetaMask pops up and um, you could sign into a site by essentially signing a message saying, uh, this is me, you know, I'm signing in. So if you are able to set up with MetaMask a signature that says, I own, you know, this Twitter handle. And then on your Twitter, you also post a watermarked image. There could be an image with a little watermark in there that says, this is my wallet address. Nobody sees it except the computers can verify that. So Intercoin can literally help you dox yourself in both directions. I own this Twitter account and I own this wallet. And that way you could actually prove a lot of things that currently you could prove your membership because right now you're right. Anybody could just put anybody could put uh, an NFT and say that they, they uh, so gonna, own it. You know? And people uh, would be able to do it with OpenSea as well or not? I mean, everything that's open source is typically remixable and it's like Legos. You can uh, snap together anything with anything. So OpenSea can be used with that for sure. Um, we're trying to remove the trust that you place into OpenSea or you place into something by essentially having multiple programs that can display your NFTs, even if OpenSea goes down or something else in principle, right? It could lie to you in principle. You can double check yes. through some other program. We actually need to dive deeper into this question because next week we're going to have NFT dedicated uh, Q&A session with some lawyers and also with people who struggling with OpenSea. So maybe that would be the good question to answer as well. Okay, cool. So when we uh, talk about NFTs next week, let me take the discussion yeah. into one more direction for today. And that is City Coins, right? When I have mm -hmm. an update on City Coins, mm -hmm. City Coins has now minted I think closer to $10 million for New York City coin. People around the world are minting city coins because they want to have a chance to win some Bitcoin. It's sort of a little bit of a coin swap between city coins and Bitcoin. Um, the hardest part is getting getting the, um, the value into the coins and that's what city coins already done. So props to them for motivating so many people to mine city coins by essentially sending their bitcoins to this network what we want to do is send city coins to this network intercoin right so in the intercoin network we have tons of applications and we're building a front-end app which we're coming out next um well in december i should say um like all great art you can't rush it <laughs> but seriously um We've been delayed by some of the, uh, you know, responsibilities, basically, with because listings happen and we were a little bit surprised by listings, and so we needed to basically make sure that everything is properly documented and everything like that. So um, 
Intercoin has a bunch of applications that um, it can help communities do. We don't do this currently. We don't create base layer protocols, but we do create them on this layer, the uh, smart contracts layer. We build the smart contracts for communities, and then we build the interface to use those smart contracts, also known as a DAP or decentralized app. What kind of applications? You all know this. I'm just basically talking for the audience who might be just looking at this video. Community membership, roles and permissions, that's like the first thing. And that's what we just talked about. NFTs, badges, status symbols, all kinds of things can look good and not just be a little entry in a database. It could actually be represented by something cool. Currencies is what I want to just mention today. Currencies is when you have your own community, not just having roles and permissions and say, hi, Mr. Mayor, how is your day today? But actually being able to pay your piano teacher and having the piano teacher go and have dinner in a restaurant and have a date. And then the date goes and has uh, goes to the hair salon and gets their hair cut. So currencies that that circulate in a city turn the city and the town into a close knit community that has their own coin just as we have our own language. So when you go down to, let's say, New Orleans and they speak Creole French over there, you know, that's something that's an insider thing that they have with each other. And if two people from Cajun country meet up in, in you know, somewhere else, like in Italy, they're going to be like, oh, wow, you're from there too. Oh, that's so cool. Even though they've never met before, but they share something in common. So having your own coin can be also that thing. Just like in Chinatown here, in all the cities like New York City, they use the renminbi to some extent. They certainly speak, you know, from all the different regions of China, their own regional dialect, and that brings them all together. So here's what the mayor of Miami had to say recently about how he's going to use city coins and all those millions of dollars. Let's have a listen. In a little more than three months, it's earned over $21 million, uh, which wow. obviously annualized, if you could annualize it, which, you know, life doesn't really work that way. But if you could annualize it, it'd be six, you know, it'd be $80 million. So uh, that is roughly, uh, you know, one fifth of the entire tax revenue. I just want to say, um, as a caveat, yes, it's currently er earning that because there's only two cities, Miami and New York. Once there's like hundreds or thousands of cities, just like any yield farming and other things, obviously the yields are going to go down. People are going to be maybe doing the same volume of, or maybe even more volume of, uh, let's call it stacking or whatever they call it, earning Bitcoin mining stacks, whatever. But it's going to be distributed among all the cities. So what is currently happening, it's not like it's a sustainable uh, uh, cash flow into the city. However, this is what's being planned to do with it. Of the city of Miami. So if you were to five exit, you could theoretically at one point pay the entire tax revenue of the city. And the city could be uh, a city that runs uh, without taxes, uh, which I think would be revolutionary. We're going to take our first draw on the first 20 million and we're going to stake uh, the remaining balance uh, in Bitcoin. So uh, what we're going to get as a, as a yield on the So let's parse this. They're going to take a draw. They're going to take 20 million dollars and they're going to do something with it, presumably and hopefully definitely something in the city the mayor has said he's going to use it on things like blockchain education and here's the thing it could be used for a ubi so that the the citizens of the city could decide what to use it for on a daily basis you go to the store because you need food you have that you need toilet paper you need that there you go you need to, you want to have plant piano lessons for your kids you can do that so i'm a big proponent of letting the people decide with consumer choice what they want to do but look at the other thing they're going to do. They're going to stake the rest and they're going to earn Bitcoin on it. And this is the proposal what to do with that. Staking is Bitcoin. And we're going to do something again that's innovative. We're breaking this news on your uh, on your channel. We're going to be the first city in America to give a Bitcoin yield uh, as a dividend directly to its residents. So we're going to create a, a digital wallet for our residents and we're going to give them a Bitcoin uh, directly from the yield of Miami coin. This is why we need to speak to the mayor of Miami ASAP because the thing is the mayor of Miami is thinking of making Bitcoin wallets, not Ethereum wallets, but Bitcoin wallets, and then giving it to everybody. That effort to give everyone a wallet is an amazing and it's a great effort. 
I really, really hope that the wallets that they give are versatile enough that they can also hold, you know, crypto assets from Binance Smart Chain and other EVM compatible networks, not just Bitcoin. Because if it's only Bitcoin, it's kind of a waste because then Intercoin, they would have to do it all over again, give them a different wallet. But hopefully the wallet they give is Trust Wallet or something similar that can handle everything. So we replied uh, to the mayor. And we basically, let's see, is this here? It's not here. Huh. Oh, here we go. We said, Miami is now one step away from a sustainable voluntary basic income. UBI, but we call it VBI because it's voluntary because you, you can opt out if you don't want to finance it, right? The people who are financing these things are doing it without taxes, just like he said. You know, the city, the city could be uh, a city that runs uh, without taxes, uh, which I think would be revolutionary. Imagine if the city could run without taxes because the coins are the ones that are being used and the usage of the actual coin in the city is what is driving the revenue of the city. So if they want to centrally plan what to do, like a park, a road, whatever they can, they'll have enough money to do that. And they can give out the rest, not as a one-time dividend or whatever, staking Bitcoin, but as a UBI in their own coin. Because what happens right now is what we said here. There are, all, there are ways to get Miami coin to recirculate in the city rather than just liquidating it. So what, what I'm talking about is that if you give out Bitcoin, and this is the same issue with El Salvador, which we could talk about some other time, you give out Bitcoin, that Bitcoin's not going to be spent inside this building, that building. It's not going to be spent on Main Street. It's not going to be spent in your local shops because they don't have the infrastructure for Bitcoin. And even if they did, it would be usable outside of the city. And most of the world is not Miami. Most of the vendors are not Miami in Miami. So when they go on Amazon or they go to anything, they're going to spend Bitcoin the way that Americans spent their um, stimulus checks, right? U.S. Americans got stimulus checks. Where did they, what happened? Crypto markets went way up, right? Stock markets went way up. People who didn't need the money immediately parked it in all these different digital assets and stocks. And that's all cool. Maybe people some took vacations. But what kind of vacation can you really take during a pandemic? So the thing is that all that money was not spent on Main Street, or I should say a lot of it was not spent on Main Street, but we have this huge now inflation or bubble in all these things. Now, I don't know whether that's a real bubble or whether you know there's potential for these technologies to be really big in the future. My money is on the latter. But the fact that money went in so fast and most of the deposits in Robinhood or whatever were $1,200 that matched exactly the stimulus check size goes to show that if you just give people money that they can spend anywhere, they ain't going to spend it in your city. They're not going to spend it in Main Street. So we can improve on this, but we need to talk to the mayors of the cities because if they get city coins, the current plan is this. We're gonna take our first draw on the first 20 million and we're gonna stake uh, the remaining balance uh, in Bitcoin. They're gonna stake, they're gonna make it sit there and they're gonna get Bitcoin. Staking and sitting there is the opposite of making money work for you because money is meant to circulate in an economy, create a real community. So unfortunately, even though it's called city coins and they have raised a lot of money, which is great, they need someone like us, the cities need someone like us to come in and essentially, let me put it this way, we bridge the city coins to intercoin and then from there we can actually um, make all of our applications work for the city. So here is a cross-chain thing that I created just yesterday to explain exactly how the cross-chain staking, how the cross-chain mechanism works. So for all of you wondering, how exactly is Intercoin going to uh, move the uh, stacks, uh, the city coins from stacks, which has this language called clarity, into the Ethereum virtual machine, which has solidity as one of the languages? How can we bridge from here to here? This is the way we do that. Anyone interested? What do you guys think? I'm going to, it's about five slides go for it go for it I check it out 
This is the nitty gritty, but you can, it's actually super understandable because it's a PDF. I try to make all my PDFs very accessible. So here we go. This is what the dev team is going to build out. Step one, the parties have to agree on the parameters of the trade. First, you find out who you're going to transact with. All right. This can be anonymous, but it's sort of like matching people who want to buy or trade with other people who want to do that trade. Then you connect with them and all of this is decentralized. OK, you could do connect with them using any interface you want. Here is the blockchain part. You agree on the parameters of the trade. And you don't even get to the blockchain yet. You agree on what the parameters of the trade are and then you sign the payload or the hash of the payload with the info. So what kind of info? Well, the trade can be complex. It could have multiple legs. It could have two legs, which is a typical one. A trades with B. Or it could have a multiple thing where A trades with B and then B sends to C and then C sends to A and they all swap things on different chains. It could be a million different variations. It could be that B sends to one NFT to one guy and uh, one NFT to this other gal and like all this stuff. So the trade is essentially which tokens are going to be sent on which blockchain and how much and who sends to which address. And finally, how long that this uh, trade will take. You see, there has to be a minimum time to allow these people on their chains to mine their transactions. And I'll get into that. That's very, very important. If you don't give them sufficient time, then the system doesn't work. Sufficient time would be like one hour, I would say would be enough, as long as they pay enough gas. So here's how it works. The parties agree on the transaction, and then they have to lock their money in escrow on their respective blockchains. Suppose that this was the Stacks chain, right? And Linda over here had $3,000 of Citicoin. All right, so this is just a different example that's what's on the screen here. So she had $3,000 of Citicoin that she had, and she decided to bridge that and, and transfer that over to the Intercoin network, which is running on, let's say, Polygon Matic or Binance Smart Chain. On the other hand, here, Edgar has, you know, time locked tokens and maybe they're NFTs, but for the purpose of this example, they would be Intercoin New York City coins running on the Intercoin system, smart contract. So here we've got City coins running on the Stacks uh, blockchain with uh, Clarity language. And here we've got City coins running on New York City coin running on Intercoin smart contracts written in Solidity running on the Ethereum virtual machine blockchain, whatever blockchain it is. All right. So the parties need to lock the money in escrow. And then here is the crucial step. The parties themselves need to verify that the other party has actually locked up their money in escrow because they can exchange transactions and sign transactions all they want. But the real question is, is the money there? Did Linda really lock up her um, $3,000 in uh, Stacks coin, uh, New York City Stacks coin? And did Edgar really lock up his $3,000 in New York City Intercoin? Okay, so to in, Edgar could be a bot and Linda could be a bot, but then the bot has to trust itself. It basically has to trust its price feed from you know, it, it's blockchain feed. It has to trust a provider like Infura or GetBlock, basically the gateway to read this blockchain. Okay, and that's what's important is it could check different feeds, but it has to be, get satisfied that, hey, Linda really did lock up this stuff. Otherwise, it's like coming to a dark alley trying to buy some drugs for some money and you show up and the guy didn't bring the money or the girl didn't bring the drugs, right? It's like, oh, my God, I wasted all this time. So it's kind of the same thing here. You don't enter into the trade unless you verify that they have locked up their thing. And that's the innovation. Most blockchain projects are obsessed with putting all of the decision logic on chain into smart contracts. And the thing is, with Intercoin, as we've understood, it took us a while. It took us like a year of talking to different teams. But I understood as, a, as an architect, I'm sort of patient zero for this for this concept is that people, self-interested, rational parties can make their own determination as to whether to enter into a trade or not. 
If they can obtain a proof that something happened, they'll enter into a trade. If that proof is unavailable, they'll just not enter into the trade for a while until things fix themselves. So anyway, step three is to verify and satisfy yourself that the other person has really locked up the money. Because why would I do this all this work for you if you don't even have the money to pay me, right? Finally, step four. Oh, okay, step four is they start posting transactions on each other's chains. So Edgar goes ahead and posts a transaction saying, I would like this trade to go through and I would like to collect my $3,000 in city coins that is going to be posted on this chain that has been uh, locked up in escrow on this chain. Remember, Edgar doesn't do this, doesn't post this unless he has personally verified that through tools or whatever, or his app has verified that um, Linda has uh, locked up her coins. Similarly, Linda says the same thing on Edgar's chain, says, hey, I'd like to get the intercoin powered city coins once this whole thing goes through. Now, they must do this in the first half of the time period. See, once the half elapsed, they can no longer post these things, which is why it's important for there to be sufficient time. They're self-interested, so they want to post these things, but they only post these things if they actually see the money being locked up on the other side. So it is in their own self-interest to post because if they don't post, they don't. nothing happens. Also, it's in their self-interest to pay enough gas to make sure that the thing gets mined before halfway, the halfway point. So you have half an hour to mine something, or you have half a day, whatever it is, to mine. They decide on the time frame. Finally, the parties complete the transaction. Once the half of the time frame elapsed, you can now claim the money. All you do is that B, which posted this, okay, uh, and A posted this. So Linda posted this transaction and Edgar posted this transaction. So now what Linda does is take Edgar's, uh, sorry, uh, what uh, Edgar does here, because he would like to, to get the, um, the city coins on stacks. Edgar decides to take Linda's transaction, which was posted on his chain, and post it on this other chain. The beautiful thing is that stacks can actually support not transactions, but payloads. Payloads and signatures, which can be verified using the exact same signature uh, mechanism as the other chain. Thankfully, the signatures are compatible, which makes this all possible. So Linda signs something that is meant to be verified on Edgar's chain, but that same payload can be also verified on Linda's chain. So once the smart contract running on stacks gets both of these things, it releases the money to whichever address Edgar wanted, which was initially specified in the parameters of the trade. So what happens is this is a good case. Stacks smart contracts are just smart enough to be able to transfer when they found that there's two signatures, everything's good, and the city coins are now transferred to Edgar's account on the first chain. Meanwhile, the same thing happens here. On this chain, Linda decides to take Edgar's signed uh, payload and post it on Edgar's blockchain, the second blockchain, in which case Edgar's tokens, which have been locked in the escrow, are now transferred to whichever address Linda wants. And I keep saying whichever address because Linda might have arbitrary addresses that they want. In fact, Linda and Edgar, one of them could be a bot. You could be buying NFTs on one chain from OpenSea running a bot. And that bot would be posting this on your chain. And then you would take it and post it on their chain. All of this can be done automatically with bots and apps. But we're just being very clear about what is trustless and what you need to trust. Edgar needs to trust his app if he's going to use one. And Linda needs to trust her bot or app if she uses one. But it's up to them which bot or app they use on their behalf. Finally, what happens if things go wrong? What if Edgar didn't post anything? If Edgar didn't post anything, then the smart contracts don't get both signatures. And therefore, after the timeout expires, both parties can take their tokens back. 
Edgar messed up. Edgar didn't post anything. Therefore, they just wasted their time. It's still better than wasting a million dollars. Finally, this is where things could fail. If Edgar tries to post a transaction to the Stacks blockchain, but it takes more than half of the time to mine. Perhaps Edgar paid a very low gas fee and it's just sitting there and then finally gets mined. This is actually a nightmare for Edgar because Linda has posted in the first half. Now Linda's gonna copy his transaction and she's gonna get his coins on his blockchain before the timeout. Now Edgar would have been better off if his, if his thing hadn't been mined at all until the timeout. If Edgar doesn't mine at all, then it looks kind of like this. Edgar submitted, nothing happened because of a very low gas fee. Didn't mine, didn't mine. Whoops, the whole thing got reversed. But unlucky for Edgar, what happened was he didn't pay enough gas. The transaction got mined in the second half of the period. So when he tries to copy Linda's transaction, says, well, I've got both signatures. I should get my coins. The smart contract says, no, sorry, Edgar. Should have paid more gas because you had all this time to mine the transaction, but you didn't pay enough gas for whatever reason. And then Edgar loses the, um, so Linda takes his coins, but Edgar, and then she gets to take her coins back. So she gets essentially her coins back and she gets Edgar's coins. Edgar doesn't get her coins. This is the one failure mode where Edgar gets screwed. What does Edgar have to do to avoid this failure mode? All Edgar has to do is make sure that Linda has actually locked up her tokens. Like I said, Edgar needs to make sure of that. Oh, come on. Edgar needs to make sure that the escrow is there in the first place. And then Edgar needs to make sure that there's enough sufficient time for Edgar to post his transaction. If Edgar feels like Linda is setting up a trap and she's making this time frame too short. Edgar simply doesn't enter into the transaction. That's the point. We trust, we let the people decide whether to enter into the transaction or not, not the blockchain. So if Edgar decides that Linda has an escrow that's locked up for an entire day and Edgar says, yeah, I can place this thing on the blockchain within half a day, which is pretty easy to do, honestly. Um, then Edgar enters in and the whole thing is completed. If for whatever reason things fail or Edgar decides not to enter the transaction, things get rolled back. The only failure mode that can ever happen is if Linda doesn't, if Linda decides to lock up her tokens, but Edgar decides to be stingy and not pay enough gas. And uh, unlucky for him, the thing gets mined right in the second half of the day. So just don't do that. <laughs> That's basically the, the, the takeaway. And then this is completely trustless and completely no one can prevent it from happening, not even city coins. So that's how the whole thing Absolutely would work. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much, Greg. Uh, it's a brilliant presentation. Uh, will we have a chance to have this presentation online where it's going to be? Who can... Uh, at this presentation when? marcy can easily do this in post-production she can cut this out and put this part by itself into its own video excellent i'm just mindful of time for you yes. to see the broke pierce yes all right uh, i gotta start so uh, heading out soon everybody but I just wanted to ask what everyone's thoughts were, if this was understandable, because if this is not understandable to you, perhaps we shouldn't publish it publicly yet. Did everybody understand kind of what the steps are involved in, in a trustless swap, a trustless bridge like this? We have Philip on the call from Australia. Maybe we can hear his opinion if he's Absolutely. I'd love to hear everybody's opinion. Did, it, did anyone not understand? Is this completely, uh, you know, foreign language to you? Uh, tell me if you didn't understand. I, I get the general picture, but um, it's probably um, for me further down the track. I mean, in the 
case that I'm trying to work on, um, I've, I've basically got to get some other people interested around here and this is, you know, some, some steps further down the track. So it's interesting, but, you know, it's not immediately relevant to me at the moment. Right, not to you at the moment. This is a technical implementation that I can tell you for a fact that some people, including um, Richard Hart from Hex, uh, I wish I, I had it right now, a clip from his uh, live stream. He does live streams just like we do, except he shows his face rather than showing the stuff he's talking about on screen. But um, it's very good, and he talks about a lot of stuff. And he said the other day, he was like, I have not seen in the entire world a trustless bridge. He's like, I have not seen them exist. And the fact is, blockchain technology has taken a wrong turn because people um, put all the decision making on chain. And that's where they're stuck. And when the Intercoin protocol comes out, we'll take concepts like this and make it so there is no miner, there is no bottleneck, and there is no blockchain. Uh, we call it the intercloud or the Intercoin cloud. Um, blockchain, intercloud, I think intercloud is going to be for the next 10 and 20 years, the term that everyone uses right now, they say blockchain, blockchain, intercloud, it's going to be the next thing. But for now, just, you can, you can appreciate this. A person's totally capable of making a decision of whether to enter into a trade or not, depending on what they decide in their own subjective, um, judgment whether it's you know they it's safe enough or not so for example if um if uh what's it called you take out a credit card and you swipe the credit card and it comes out that it hasn't been approved the vendor does not have to give you the goods right you can't walk out of the store just because you swiped a credit card the credit card has to prove and say to you yes the transaction has been approved now, if the transaction's been declined, the vendor tells you, sorry, and you just use another credit card, one that you try it again with something else. Now, it, what happens in that ambiguous case where you swipe it and the machine just sits there and you're not sure what it's going to say, and it just sits there for an hour? Was it approved? Was it not approved? So Intercoin Protocol, which is a totally separate topic for another time, uh, for another show, Intercoin Protocol handles that by having you have an extra endorsement after it's been approved you still need to endorse the transaction and the reason is because if you um if it comes back that it was approved suppose that you went with your credit card and you did that swipe and it's just hanging there for two hours and you're like man we gotta decide are you giving me the couch or not like i, I have movers here are you giving me the couch so what happens is then that the guy goes okay pay me with this other credit card right and it goes through approved Imagine if a day later you learn that the first one was approved also. It was just a glitch, but they finally approved it. Imagine that. Thankfully, banks are the other way. They're, they're very conservative. But let's say that they had approved it. It actually would not be posted to the blockchain history because you would not endorse that first transaction. And that's why the people need to have a say in their own transactions. The problem is right now with current blockchains, too much is put over here into the miner into the central bottleneck of the entire network um, and every f 10 minutes on bitcoin every few seconds even on solana even on the biggest fa fastest blockchains that pride themselves and all this they store the entire state of the whole world and richard hart admits this with pulse and everything it's like terabytes of information and even if you didn't store the entire history if your blockchain is used by so many people, you're going to store terabytes of information, just the current state, not even the history. This is, unfortunately, this is a suboptimal, very sort of brute force approach to solving the double spend problem. It's the only one we have, except for IOTA and like a bunch of other, you know, hash graph and a bunch of other ones. This is the dominant paradigm today. And that's what we're going with because that's what people use. But in the end of the day, Intercoin is going to improve this too. But for the time being, the reason why Richard Hart and others have never seen a trustless bridge is because everyone's so obsessed with having the, all the decisions be made on chain. And if you're going to have um, a swap, sometimes you're just going to have to trust yourself 
or your bot or your app or whatever, because you're trusting them anyway when you're looking at MetaMask. You're trusting MetaMask to not have shipped faulty code to you. You know, you're not exactly verifying every single shipment of MetaMask or your browser or your operating system. That's called the trusted computing base. So essentially, you're trusting something. You're trusting your phone. You're trusting your operating system. You may as well trust yourself and your wallet. And if you trust that, then we could basically build a better wallet. Um, so that's a game changer. And I can tell you right now, the Australian uh, group is paying a grant for this because they need it. I think if I talk to Pulse, they would probably pay a grant to do this. You know, 100K grant. Uh, we're getting or this or that everybody needs this we could go to Solana right now and, and get them to pay a grant we could even go to Stacks blockchain and get them to pay a grant because this kind of thing has to be built and once it's built it's open source and everybody gets access to it so we may as well get the money now <laughs> to you know because we're building the same thing and we're reusing it across everybody so there you go that's basically what we're doing we're going to have an incredible technology that's going to help bridge from stack city coin to inner coin city coin and then we can approach the miami mayor we could approach all these people and tell them they should have a better idea than just so uh, what we're going to get as a as a yield on the staking is bitcoin and we're going to do something again that's innovative we're breaking this news on your uh on your it's not innovative it's literally just airdropping bitcoin into people's wallets it's innovative in the sense of any city yes cities don't really do this right now and that's nice but you know what would be even more innovative and i think new york city coin is going to do this first is to do what we do which is adopt inner coin and have your local community currency and your local merchants accept it all so that for the first time you're not stuck with an asset that leaves your city as soon as you give it to people but a but an asset that lives in your city lives in your smart economy and something that actually provides you wealth over and over and over and over uh, rather than simply giving money away like a bucket with the water with uh, with a hole ripped in the bottom of it so that's intercoin uh, that's where we're going in December I should have some demos for you of this thing by the end of the year and I'll send it to the guys at New Genesis I'll send it to the guys um, uh, at pulse probably and a bunch of other ones um we'll see we'll see probably would like to partner with them for other things um but that's basically where we're going in december so now that this is all public anybody can view this it's no longer private information or insider information um that's how i like to disclose it because if people are trading itr tokens i think this is the proper venue to sort of explain what's happening publicly because uh, then the SEC and others can say, great, everyone knows exactly what is going on as much as we do. And so if you follow this channel, you follow all this, you'll learn a lot more about Intercoin. Um, that's it. That's the inside track and what we're doing. Absolutely brilliant news. Thank you, Greg. Absolutely. All right, and everybody, thank any you, final... Thank uh, for joining today's show. I'm oh, sorry. No, I just want to say speaking? any final uh, words. Go ahead. Yep. Uh, I was actually just going to uh, end the show by thanking everybody for joining and participating in the conversation. And don't forget to join our next show next Wednesday, 12 p.m. We'll post the agenda and the topics soon on Telegram. And be part of the movement by opening discussions and, of course, checking some of the discussions we already have in our community forum. You can go to community.intercoin.org for you to, to you know, be a member, introduce yourself. We have an introduction section where everybody can introduce themselves, their background, and tell them a little bit more about themselves. So thank you everybody and thank you, Greg. Uh, this is really great news and uh, looking forward to the next show. Absolutely, and I just wanna say one last thing to everybody listening. Definitely, you see this person right here, I didn't even know this. I already invested in Intercoin, but I wanna be more involved. Our team is all the time on the forum and we want to welcome you and we want to talk to you, whether you are a technologist, whether you're um, an economist, or whether you are a socio-political commentator like Noam Chomsky, uh, who we interviewed. Definitely, please join the forum and let's discuss this together because we're building a movement 
and we need you and we need your input because once we build immutable smart contracts, that's how it's going to be. So now is your chance to sort of have your voice heard. If you see a problem, don't say something and please join the forum. Thank you very much for watching and I uh, hope to see you on the forum. Bye everyone.